Welcome to the webinar series in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. My name is Matt Balhoff. I'm the director of the center and a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at UT Austin. To learn more about us and how you can collaborate, please visit our website and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. The center is comprised of 24 principal investigators, mostly professors in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. The research we do is a very broad range of subsurface applications, technical disciplines and engineering tools, as I show here. We collaborate with industry in a lot of different ways. One of them is our industrial affiliates projects, of which we have many. In particular, um, our webinar speaker today, Dr. Zoya Hadari, will likely talk a little bit about her IAP, the multi-scale rock physics of unconventional and carbonate reservoirs. Our monthly webinar series are informative industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators with the center. They're usually the first Friday of the month. This month is a little bit different since the first Friday was January 1st, but generally the first Friday of the month at noon via Teams, all webinars are uploaded on our YouTube page, but I do encourage you to watch us live. Some upcoming webinars. Next month, John Foster will give his webinar on scientific machine learning, an overview and discussion of applications in petroleum engineering. And our March webinar will be given by Dr. Kami Stefanori. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Zoya Hadari is an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Before joining the University of Texas, she was an assistant professor at Texas A&M University in College Station from 2011 to 2015. She received a PhD in Petroleum Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin and she has been the founder of the and the director of the University of Texas at Austin Industrial Affiliates research program on multi-scale rock physics since 2016. Dr. Hidari has too many awards for me to mention in a short period of time, but I will mention that she has the 2020 SBWLA Young Professional Technical Award, the 2019 awards by EAG, the Aerie Van Wilden Award, the AIME Rossiter Raymond Memorial Award, and she is an SBE Distinguished Member. Zoya has published more than 170 papers in peer-reviewed journals and conference proceedings, and she has served as the Vice President of Education for the Society of Petrophysics and Well Log Analysts. Uh, I, with that, um, I will turn it over to Zoya to present her webinar. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for attending this webinar, and thank you very much, Matt, uh, for the introduction. I'm an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the research we perform in our team on advanced formation evaluation of organic rich mud rocks. And uh, I specifically talk about the importance of rock fabric and geochemistry uh, in formation evaluation of these uh, complex formations. I'm going to start with a brief introduction to my research team and projects, and then I talk about the challenges we have in formation evaluation of organic rich mud rocks, and then I talk about uh, how uh, we uh, overcome these challenges in our team and uh, bring some examples of accomplishments and ongoing projects in my team. I start with uh, some projects related to enhanced uh, evaluation of uh, hydrocarbon reserves and then talk about the impact of fabric and at the end talk about the geochemistry and impacts on Betability and multi-phase uh, fluid flow. So, uh, before going to do, through the uh, technical part of the presentation, I would like to introduce my research team. Uh, so, I have had the pleasure of working with many fabulous researchers, students, and uh, postdoctoral researchers uh, during my career in Texas A&M and also at UT Austin. And I always say in the beginning of my presentation that the credit uh, of all the results that you see today goes to my wonderful uh, research students and staff. Uh, 
what we do at UT Austin in our uh, joint industry research uh, uh, consortium on multi-scale rock physics is to integrate multi-scale and multi-physics uh, geophysical measurements uh, for uh, subsurface characterization. We, build, uh, we work on both computational and experimental aspects of the uh, uh, research problems that we have, and you're going to see examples of those uh, accomplishments in uh, today's webinar. Uh, the most uh, important focuses of uh, the research accomplishments that we have are uh, especially anisotropic and heterogeneous formations such as organic rich mud rocks and carbonates and indeed um, the type of formations that are conventional formation evaluation methods fail in uh, reliable uh, characterization of the reservoir. So when we deal with uh, especially heterogeneous and anisotropic formations, interpretation of multi-scale and multi-physics formation data become very challenging. And uh, we deal with uh, borehole geophysical measurements, well logs, and uh, core scale measurements and uh, pore scale uh, measurements and images as well. And integrating all of these can be very challenging. Uh, in the case of organic rich mud rocks, we don't even know how reliable the core measurements that uh, we have are and the techniques for assessment of uh, core properties in the lab. When we go to the porous scale imaging, uh, there's always this, uh, this question of how reliable these uh, fine scale uh, measurements and imagings uh, are in uh, reservoir characterization in uh, larger scales. So and eventually when uh, we deal with these different types of measurements in different scale, we have to translate them to petrophysical, compositional and mechanical properties. Now, uh, this translation is through rock physics models, right? And uh, it is very common uh, that we calibrate this rock physics model for the rock that we deal with. But when we go to uh, organic rich mud rocks, these complex uh, rocks, and the calibrations that we perform on our conventional methods can be uh, questionable and can lead to lots of uncertainty in the outcomes of formation evaluation. So something that you will uh, hear during this presentation multiple times is the importance of rock fabric and geochemistry and geological information in interpretation of this uh, multi-scale and multi-physics formation data and in uh, developing new rock physics models for interpretation of this data. And this is something that we take uh, very seriously in our research projects in my team. So in my team, we believe that we need unconventional rock physics models and measurement techniques for evaluation of formations with unconventional rock physics. And when I say unconventional, it refers to the type of rocks and porous structures where our conventional techniques fail to evaluate them reliably. And then even if we perform uh, calibration, if, even if we need to perform some, some sort of calibration, it has to be physics based uh, and we need to make sure that the models that we use for interpretation uh, are reliable for these types of rocks. We also believe that integration of multi-scale formation data is necessary for uh, this kind of especially heterogeneous formations. Now let's talk about uh, the complexity of uh, these formations and let's say and let's see why we call them complex. So on the left hand side uh, here we see a micro CT scan image of a sandstone that we know as a conventional rock. And so these are different slices in a 3D volume uh, that is uh, imaged through a micro CT scanner. Uh, the darker gray represents the pore space and you can see the pores are pretty big. The lighter gray uh, represent the grains. The pores are relatively big and uh, they are well connected. So and most of the conventional techniques that we have in formation evaluation work well in these kind of formations. On the right hand side, this is a micro CT scan image of a carbonate rock and uh, you can see the pore structure becomes a little bit more complex, meaning that I have multimodal pore size distribution. Some of these pores might not be well connected 
and uh, so interpretation becomes a little bit more challenging and some of the conventional models that we have might not even work in these carbonate formation formations and well there will be actually also some sort of complexities related to the interfacial properties including wettability of the rock that can make formation evaluation pretty challenging now the last uh, video that I'm going to show you in the background uh, is uh, for an organic rich mud rock formation. And as you can see, the pore structure is completely different compared to the other rocks. We see some pore network inside this darker space, which is organic content, which is kerogen. We have complex mineralogy. We have a complex clay distribution. Uh, we have pyrite, we have clay, we have different types of minerals, we have organic content. So both mineralogy is very complex, a spatial distribution of different components is actually uh, different than the other two cases. And the pore network is also very complex. And I can say the fluid distribution is also very complex. So the two important um, properties that we are going to talk about is going to be rock fabric and geochemistry. So when I say rock fabric, I'm talking about the spatial distribution of these different components that you see in here. That component can be clay minerals, it can be uh, fluid components, can be organic and matter network uh, in the rock. So a spatial distribution and connectivity of different uh, networks and also geochemistry in particular, we're going to talk about uh, chemical composition uh, and thermal maturity of organic content and its impact on the properties, the rock physics properties that we observe at larger scale and how we should deal with that. Now, when we talk about formation evaluation, one of the most uh, basic properties of the rock fluid system that we estimate is water saturation and hydrocarbon saturation. So in situ assessment of hydrocarbon reserves in organic rich mud rocks can be pretty challenging and uh, when we deal with uh, conventional formations it's very common for in situ assessment of water and hydrocarbon saturation to use resistivity measurements and then these resistivity measurements are translated to hydrocarbon and water saturation through conventional resistivity porosity saturation models such as Archie's equation that you see on the left hand side and the uh, Waxman Smith equation that you see on the right hand side and it can be any other shady sand model and they work actually very well uh, for the case of conventional formations when uh, the only conductive component of the rock is saline water as you see on the left hand side this represents actually a, a, a conventional rock and uh, when when uh, the pores are well connected but in the case of organic rich mud rocks as i mentioned we have a complex a special distribution of different minerals. We might have uh, minerals that cannot be considered as uh, non-conductive anymore. So the conductivity is not necessarily through the water network anymore. Organic matter can have contribution uh, on electrical properties of the rock and they need actually to be taken into account in our interpretation. Conventional models and do not take these into account. So let me show you what would be the consequence of using conventional methods for interpretation of hydrocarbon reserves and water saturation. Here on the y-axis, we see the log-based water saturation estimates uh, using the conventional method. On the x-axis, we have uh, water saturation from core measurements. And uh, as you can see in this organic rich mud rock formation, uh, uh, we are overestimating uh, water saturation. And this is a behavior that we see very often in organic rich mud rocks. So what is the source for this overestimation of water saturation and indeed significant underestimation of hydrocarbon reserves? And we decided actually to look into this uh, many years ago uh, with uh, my first student um, that I supervised. So we looked in into uh, a couple of uh, uh, organic rich mud rock formations through uh, through years and then uh, here is an example and so we uh, see on the and uh, on the left hand side some conventional well logs and then interpretation of mineralogy and this is xrd and then you see estimates of uh, porosity uh, plotted on top of core measurements and then on the last track you see water saturation estimates 
So uh, we did this interpretation and then uh, we realized that we have some uh, error in estimates of water saturation if we go with conventional uh, shady sand models for interpretation of the resistivity measurements. As you can see in here on the y-axis, we have relative error in estimates of water saturation. On the x-axis, we have volumetric concentration of kerogen, and we realized that when the volumetric concentration of kerogen increases, the relative error in estimates of water saturation increases as well. So there is something about presence of organic content, and we have observed the same behavior in other uh, examples of organic rich mud rocks. Let's take a look at this other example. On the y-axis, I have errors in estimates of water saturation if I use a conventional method, and in this case, uh, a dual water model is used. On the x-axis, we have a hydrogen index, which is correlated to thermal maturity of the rock. So uh, you, as you can see, as uh, and the hydrogen index decreases and, and thermal maturity of the rock increases, we see an increase in error in estimates of water saturation. So it's not only about the amount of uh, organic content or kerogen that I have in the rock, it's about thermal maturity as well and its uh, geochemistry. So this is suggesting that uh, we need to look into uh, the organic content and geochemistry of the rock uh, more seriously. So and that was the time we started uh, thinking about extracting uh, kerogen from these rocks and look into the different uh, physical properties of kerogen. One of those properties was electrical resistivity. So we extracted some kerogen and here uh, we see some example of a powder kerogen. And then uh, my wonderful students uh, worked on these pure kerogen samples and it's very difficult to extract kerogen from organic rich mud rocks. And, Whoever has extracted this uh, kerogen powder from the samples know that how difficult is it is to extract uh, kerogen from the rock. And then uh, my students made uh, pallets like this, uh, cylindrical pallets like this for performing some measurements. And the first type of measurements they performed was electrical resistivity as a function of uh, thermal maturity. And in this plot, you see the temperature to which samples were heated. So uh, indeed, basically, this is heat treatment temperature, and we synthetically uh, change the thermal maturity of the samples instead of using uh, samples at uh, different natural maturity level. We have done that work as well, but this case is synthetic thermal maturation. And we observed that as the um, temperature, the, basically the thermal maturity of the samples increases from left to right, we uh, see uh, initially an increase in electrical resistivity, but the electrical resistivity decreases eventually. Now, the first uh, part of this plot uh, can be because of the decrease in conductive pathways that I'm going to talk about a lot more at the end of this presentation, which is a very uh, interesting behavior that we observed that led to some other interesting achievements. And then uh, we start seeing a decrease in the second phase uh, which can be because of the increase in aromaticity or graphitization. And we uh, demonstrated with some measurements, solid state NMR measurements, uh, and also some imaging that aromaticity and graphitization both increases at, at the higher thermal maturity levels. For instance, actually, this is a TEM image, and you can see actually that um, we observe uh, graphite like fringes at higher thermal maturity. Presence of graphite is uh, obvious. Now, uh, in addition to organic content, uh, there are some uh, other dominant components in organic rich mud rocks that are very important, including clay minerals and their spatial distribution. So uh, clay minerals themselves actually, uh, they might actually show some electrical behavior uh, and uh, depending on uh, the composition, depending on the distribution. And also it is important to consider how they are distributed compared to other conductive components in the rock. So uh, this is something that needs to be quantified and needs to be taken into account in our model development for interpretation of the measurements. Another thing that is very important to consider is how to quantify the cation exchange capacity of these clay minerals when they are inside the rock. And well, this is another important topic that we looked into with one of my PhD students, former PhD students, uh, to quantify cation exchange capacity uh, reliably and use that for 
interpretation. But in, for the purpose of this presentation, I only talk about rock fabric and the distribution of uh, clay minerals. So uh, as we mentioned, rock fabric is important and needs to be taken into account in our modeling and in our interpretation. Now, uh, when I talk about rock fabric, I just want to show you some pictures to clarify what I mean by that. So in these two pictures that I have on the first row, uh, I have kind of a dispersed distribution of different components here. I have on the left hand side, I have dispersed distribution of kerogen. On the right hand side, I have dispersed distribution of pirate network. So when I have this dispersed distribution of a conductive network, for instance, in the rock, it might not really affect uh, the properties such as um, electrical properties. Uh, but uh, on the next row, you see uh, some uh, layer distribution of different components. On the left hand side, you see layer distribution of uh, kerogen. On the right hand side, you see layer distribution of pyrite in here. So and we see this kind of layer distribution in many organic rich mud rock formations, such as, for instance, Eagle Ford, Woodford, we see this kind of behavior very often. So when we deal with, for instance, electrical properties, uh, this layer distribution might actually um, have a more significant impact on uh, the properties. Uh, it might be the impact might be different for different other type of uh, measurements. So, but something that is important in here is to quantify this distribution and take that into account. Let me show you an example. So we have uh, we have here actually different distributions of pyrite in the rock. So the first case here we have no connectivity in the pyrite network and. Uh, on the y-axis, we have horizontal resistivity. On the x-axis, we have volumetric concentration of pyrite. So we have no conductivity, connectivity, so there is no impact on the electrical resistivity. Then I have lower level of connectivity and uh, the higher level of connectivity. So you see as the connectivity increases, uh, you see more significant impact on resistivity. But resistivity is not something that uh, we um, care about that much. We might care about actually the estimates of uh, hydrocarbon and water saturation. So let's see what the impact is on uh, estimates of water saturation. Here we see the relative error in estimates of water saturation on the y-axis and on the x-axis horizontal connectivity of pyrite network. And you can see that this relative error in estimates of water saturation increase as um, the horizontal connectivity of pyrite network increase. And we have different techniques to quantify this connectivity of different networks in the rock and this error can be extremely high uh, for a little bit of pyrite which is actually four percent pyrite in this case uh, in the rock so it is important and uh, to take into account uh, spatial distribution and connectivity of different networks how to overcome these challenges that we talked about well we need to develop reliable rock physics models that honor the complexity of these rocks they honor uh, the complex mineralogy uh, in the rock, they need to honor the rock physics and the rock fabric and also the impact of rock fabric and also the impact of uh, geochemistry. And we need to actually take that into account in our rock physics model. We need to take them into account in our formation evaluation. And the summary is that we need uh, new rock physics models and workflows uh, for this for these challenging formations. Now let's actually start with reserves evaluation. Let me show you some results on that. So uh, to be able to improve our models uh, for um, interpretation of electrical measurements for reserves evaluation, we, as I mentioned, uh, we uh, took into account the local connectivity of the clay network, the distribution of the clay network uh, through quantification of the spatial distribution and tortuosity of the network, and then uh, we started actually adding other components, conductive components uh, such as pyrites through, through some effective medium modeling to come up with an analytical method for interpretation of the measurements. And then we also take into account the uh, conductivity of organic matter if it has a contribution, because in some cases it might not even have a contribution, but if it has a contribution, you need to take that into account and a special uh, distribution of uh, the organic content. Uh, for an uh, upscale interpretation of conductivity and electrical connectivity. We did actually the same thing for uh, the case of uh, dielectric measurements. Now, let me actually show you some results. I don't go through the details of model development, but if you are interested, we have some publications and I will be 
more than happy to talk about them in more detail. Now let's actually uh, see uh, how it works. So we started with porous scale verification. So on the right hand side, you see an example of an organic rich mud rock and on the left hand side, shaley sand formation. So the application of these models are, ne are not necessarily organic rich mud rocks. We first test these models on simpler cases, including shaley sand formation, see whether we can see the impact of different components of the rock and then go to more complex cases. So uh, the blue points show uh, the results from the proposed method. The red shows the results from Waxman Smith, which is a shaded sand model. So on the Y axis in both cases, you see the estimated water saturation and the X axis is actual water saturation. So you see the new model actually improved the estimated water saturation significantly. But something important in here is that we need to quantify the spatial distribution and basically rock fabrics somehow. When we have images, it might be easy. But as I mentioned, images might not be actually representative of the larger scale measurements, which is, for instance, uh, uh, well logs. So uh, we were receiving these questions all the time that uh, how can we apply them in the in apply these models, these nice models in larger scale. So eventually last year, one of my PhD students uh, tried uh, applying these methods in larger scales and uh, develop an inversion algorithm to uh, find these rock fabric related parameters and, and take that into account in the interpretation. So here are some results on the uh, left hand side. We see conventional well logs and the interpretation for the mineralogy and uh, kerogen content. Then on the on track eight, we see results of TOC and porosity. Track 10 and 11 show the results of water saturation using the proposed model and using Archie's model, which is a conventional technique, and we compare the results against core measurements in red. So as you can see, uh, the proposed method without any calibration effort, I want to emphasize that there is no calibration effort involved, uh, improve estimates of water saturation significantly. And for instance, the conventional interpretation is overestimating water saturation on the right hand side as we expected. And then uh, we see consistently the same behavior and uh, throughout this depth interval in these three zones that we have in here. And if you want to see the results on a cross plot on the left hand side, you see the results uh, from a proposed from the proposed model comparison of the log based estimates uh, against core measurements on the right hand side is the results from uh, Archie's model. Uh, uh, the green dots represent Archie's model results before calibration and uh, with uh, default parameters. Uh, and then uh, even after calibration, we still see a higher uh, relative error compared to our developed model, which is independent of any calibration efforts compared to core measurement. And this is important because, as I mentioned in the beginning, core measurements come with, come with some level of uncertainty for assessment of petrophysical properties when we deal with uh, organic rich mud rocks. So it would be nice to uh, minimize the amount of calibration. So we have done actually similar type of work for interpretation of dielectric permittivity measurements. And so here on the Y axis, we see estimated water saturation on the X axis, actual water saturation. These are the results from CREAM model, which is actually a well-known technique for assessment of water filled uh, porosity in the rocks using dielectric permittivity and a uh, green are the results from the new model that we take into account fabric into our interpretation and you see the results of the new technique um, uh, it decreased the error in estimates of uh, water saturation now that we talk about fabric let's actually dive into that a little bit deeper so rock fabric needs to be quantified in different scales, right? I showed um, some results from the porous scale evaluation, but this needs to be uh, quantified in larger scales, especially if our measurements are performed at larger scale. And so uh, in the next step uh, of the present, next phase of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about rock fabric a little bit more in detail. So log rock fabric at the larger scale can be quantified with some um, high resolution uh, image logs or uh, CT scan uh, images of the cores in the lab. And as you can see here, uh, the variation in uh, rock properties might not be observable uh, in conventional well logs, but we can see actually this variation uh, 
on image loss. So it is actually important to quantify that uh, and then we take that into account uh, for our interpretation. And But most image logs are interpreted manually and uh, the fabric from them are obtained manually. There are some uh, quantitative efforts to uh, get rock fabric from image logs uh, automatically. Um, most of them are very computationally expensive and uh, require, some of them require uh, supervised training. And when we deal with supervised training, it means that uh, things might not be real time and uh, it's very dependent on the database that uh, we train the system with. Another actually challenge in here is that whenever actually we perform rock classification that has to be part of the formation evaluation, the number of rock classes uh, is important. It's very difficult to estimate. So uh, our hypothesis was that taking into account uh, this rock fabric from images can improve uh, these efforts. So let me tell you actually uh, what is the formation evaluation workflow that uh, we developed by combining conventional measurements and uh, fabric related features. So we do conventional uh, well log interpretation, multi-mineral analysis, and uh, we, at the same time, uh, we perform an uh, image analysis to get some uh, rock fabric related features. And at, at the same time, petrophysical and compositional properties. Then through an unsupervised classification, uh, we, uh, uh, we estimate uh, integrated rock classes and then at the same time optimize number of rock classes. This optimization can uh, be just uh, purely mathematical based or uh, we have some techniques that incorporate uh, petrophysical properties uh, through a cost function, through minimizing the cost function uh, for uh, optimizing the number of rock classes. And then we use this rock classification efforts that take into account rock fabric as an input to formation evaluation and update our rock physics models uh, for in each one of those classes and go through this workflow again to estimate petrophysical properties. Now, let me show you some field application in, in the Wolfcamp formation. So uh, we applied and introduced workflow to Wolfcamp formation in the Southern Midland Basin. So we had more than 100 wells. We did a preliminary petrophysical evaluation in all these wells for development of petrophysical models. Eight of these wells had image logs. So uh, we performed, uh, we applied this workflow on those eight wells. Two wells uh, with image logs uh, had a core description available. Uh, they were actually perfect for workflow verification. And in five wells, we had production data. This is again actually very nice for workflow verification to see the impact on uh, production. So let me show you some examples of uh, rock classification here. Uh, so these are actually two examples on the left hand side. Uh, I have image logs and then interpretation of minerals using conventional logs. And as you can see, when we do petrophysical rock classification based on uh, the conventional logs without taking into account images, we might not really distinguish these different rock uh, classes that I have in here. Image based rock classification here shows three types of classes because it takes into account the fabric, right? And then integrating these two is going to give me three rock classes. On the right hand side, uh, the fabric doesn't change much on this particular image, but we see some variation using uh, the conventional measurements because it incorporates other uh, types of measurements. So petrophysical rock classes actually detect two, image-based rock classes uh, detect only one, and when we integrate them, uh, we see two. So this shows that uh, image-based and petrophysical-based rock classes should be integrated to give me a reliable classification and understanding of what's going on in the formation. So we integrated both of these and uh, applied them in uh, the wells that we had image logs. So here you see the comparison of the integrated rock class and uh, the little faces uh, that were um, provided to us uh, and were analyzed by a, a, a geologist in the past. So uh, we automatically detected six rock classes which were in compare, which was which were in agreement with the uh, previously detected little faces, and as you can see, uh, 
uh, on the left hand side. We also quantitatively compared these two rock classification efforts and uh, we realized that in more than 85% uh, of the uh, zones uh, we detected um, the rock classes, the, the, these two techniques were in agreement. Now let's see the impact on the formation evaluation results. So on the left hand side and the first uh, uh, cross plot shows the porosity. And uh, so Y axis is core porosity, X axis is uh, the log base estimates of porosity. The blue uh, data points are the initial porosity estimates without any uh, rock classification and taking into account of the uh, fabric. And the uh, orange uh, data points uh, show the final estimates of porosity after incorporating fabric into the picture. And then here we have uh, estimates of water saturation. Uh, we see the same improvement and uh, total organic carbon content uh, on the last uh, cross plot. And in all of them, we see uh, significant improvements after uh, taking into account image and fabric uh, related parameters into interpretation. Now let's see the impact on uh, production. So on the y-axis, we see cumulative production and on the x-axis, we have the results for different wells. Uh, the blue columns represent uh, group one, uh, which were completed uh, in intervals uh, abundant with uh, rock class one and two, which were the best rock classes that we identified. Group two uh, represent in the production in the medium a level of rock quality, uh, rock quality, uh, rock type three and four, and group three are the worst uh, rock types. And you can see the production is significantly higher in group one, and compared to the other two groups. Uh, I want to emphasize that we understand that when we uh, talk about production, there are many other properties and parameters uh, incorporated into um, it, it in includes uh, it is. It, a lot, of, a lot of other parameters are important in uh, seeing a high or low production. It's not only in the properties of the rock or the proper the quality of the rock class. But what I want to emphasize in here is that the rock quality, as we've seen here, is also important. So, and we can actually improve our production decisions if we understand what the rock quality is and we uh, quantitatively take that into account in our decision making process. And now that I talked about uh, rock quality and uh, rock fabric, I want to show the importance of rock fabric on uh, assessment of mechanical properties. So mechanical properties when acoustic measurements are not available are usually obtained using uh, uh, effective medium modeling uh, efforts. So here I want to show uh, how the distribution of these different minerals affect uh, elastic properties, assessment of elastic properties. So here's an FFEB SEM image of an organic rich mud rock sample, and you see different components, pyrite, quartz, clay, and kerogen in this image. So uh, it is the same image. Basically, we perform numerical simulation, and we develop a numerical simulator to estimate elastic properties here, and uh, that takes into account the special distribution of different rock components, as we see uh, in this case, or any other distribution, right? Uh, so for this and these there is three samples sample 1a 1b and 1c they have the same concentration of minerals but different distributions right and i want to demonstrate in here that the distribution matters right or fabric matters and you can see the young modulus estimates in here and uh, that vary uh, in the, with these different distributions right now if I don't perform this numerical modeling and go with self-consistent approximation, which is an effective medium modeling effort, uh, you can see that uh, we cannot really uh, take into account the impact of this complex distribution of different components, and uh, we will observe a so relative difference, significant relative difference in different ca cases compared to the numerical simulation results, which is considered as the ground truth. So. Uh, this difference actually can be higher or lower depending on the uh, mineral components that I have in the rock. And we have performed this sensitivity analysis in other types of rocks as well. Now, let me talk about geochemistry a little bit more. 
so as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, I want just to go back to that discussion. So we got interested in the effective properties of pure kerosene. So we quantified different properties, including electrical resistivity, and I showed you this plot in the past, in the beginning of the presentation. So uh, the red uh, represents uh, a formation uh, that has high thermal maturity and uh, naturally at a natural state, and then uh, purple uh, shows uh, the results from a formation with lower thermal maturity carriage. And we uh, synthetically mature samples taken from these two formations, and uh, the y-axis shows the heat treatment temperature. So we see actually an increase and then a decrease in uh, both of them, but the peak happens at a different heat treatment temperatures, right? So these uh, numbers are important, and we are going to see them again in the next slides. Now, we also performed measurements on dielectric constant, and we see actually a decrease and an increase as the heat treatment temperature increases, right, in both of the samples. But this peak happens at different locations, basically almost the same as the previous one. And the last one uh, is the Young's modulus of kerosene. We did some non indentation tests to quantify that. And so you see a decrease and an increase in Young's modulus of kerogen, and we published this results and discussed the reasons behind it. But the peak actually happens at different uh, uh, heat treatment temperatures, uh, kind of consistent with the other two. Now, the only way we could explain uh, this initial uh, behavior compared to the longer term behavior on the data was presence of some water at lower thermal maturity levels. Uh, and we couldn't explain that. Uh, because we were hitting the samples, we were uh, emptying the samples from any moisture, but for some reason, actually, it appeared in the rock. We, we could see actually a presence of some uh, water in the rock, um, in the samples, in the powder samples, uh, or the, the cylindrical uh, samples that I showed you. Uh, so we couldn't explain that. So uh, we had a hypothesis that the wettability of the samples have some influence on this behavior. So we decided actually to quantify that wettability. So we prepared uh, formation, uh, kerogen samples from different formations. On the left hand side is uh, formation A and the, uh, at lower thermal maturity and the same formation at higher thermal maturity. We synthetically matured the sample. Uh, one of my PhD students, Archana, uh, performed uh, extract the loss of kerogen samples from different formations and perform uh, these measurements. So this is actually as a Cecil drop uh, method results and we are going to drop in this uh, video a drop a small droplet of water on the surface of the kerogen. kerogen. The black surface is kerogen, pure kerogen. So let's actually do it for the low thermal maturity level. And as you can see, this water sample just spreads on the surface, a low contact angle. On the right hand side, this is high thermal maturity and you see that it stays on the sample. On top of the sample, it shows that uh, this is not water, but on the left hand side, uh, the sample is water. -bed. So these results actually confirm that kerogen is water, but low thermal maturity and oil bed at higher thermal maturity level. And what can cause this? Well, there are different reasons behind this, and uh, they all uh, are related to the geochemistry of the samples. High amount of oxygenated functional group groups could affect it, or uh, it can be the non-polar aromatic uh, carbon content in kerogen, or low degree of aromaticity, aromaticity that increases the ratio of hydrophilic a small molecule change. They all can affect the behavior that we observe. But uh, we decided actually to expand this work for different types of uh, kerogen for different levels of thermal maturity. So here is the log uh, logarith hydrogen index in the logarithmic uh, scale, and then uh, in the y-axis you see x-axis you see the contact angle. And these are different uh, kerogen samples from formation A in blue and from formation B in red. And as you can see, you know, when uh, hydrogen index decreases and thermal maturity increases, this um, contact angle increases. 
which means that my sample become uh, oil bed in this case and in lower thermal maturity it is a strongly a hydrophilic so uh, aromatic carbon content as i mentioned has an influence so here on the y-axis we see aromatic carbon content on the x-axis contact angle and we see the same behavior so i want to emphasize that uh, formation a is at lower thermal maturity level naturally and formation be at higher thermal maturity and we synthetically thermally mature both samples to get a wide range of thermal maturity at synthetic maturation level and natural maturation level. Now we perform all of those uh, measurements in lab condition, lab temperature, and we wanted to develop a workflow that enables us to expand this to higher pressures, higher temperatures, and like in situ condition and to uh, give us the ability of testing this on different kerogen samples and having control on certain properties. So we started performing some molecular dynamic simulations and I'm going to show you some results of that. So here uh, I have kerogen type one, bunch of kerogen type two at different thermal maturity levels and kerogen type three. And let's see actually the results of uh, molecular dynamic simulation and see whether it can share some important information with me. So we uh, simulations are performed on water droplet placed on kerogen surface until an equilibrium is achieved. And uh, we quantified the contact angle uh, of this water droplet. And let's see, take a look at the results. So uh, here on this track, you see the results of this final uh, simulations and the simula final results of the simulation for different kerogen samples that I have. Kerogen sample type 1, 2 and 3. And as you can see, uh, the contact angle increases when the kerogen type, uh, the, the contact angle changes for different uh, types of kerogen. And uh, this is obvious that contact angle is impacted by both oxygen to carbon ratio and aromat aromaticity of uh, the kerogen samples. Now here uh, we have a contact angle measurements and then uh, this is kerogen type 2 at different thermal maturity levels and you see as the kerogen uh, thermal maturity changes, the contact angle increases. And uh, here you see the oxygen to carbon ratio and aromaticity on the uh, other side and uh, the contact angle measurements for different uh, or oxygen to carbon ratio and aromaticity and you see uh, how the oxygen to carbon ratio and aromaticity affect this contact angle. Indeed, contact angle of water droplets increase, increases with increase in thermal maturity, and this is uh, the results that we obtained with experimental measurements as well. Now, what about the impact of temperature? Now that we have these molecular dynamic simulations work, we can uh, go to different uh, temperatures and see what is the impact of temperature. So here I have actually contact angle measurements and uh, temperature is on the X axis. So as you can see, when the temperature increases, uh, this contact angle uh, decreases and we see 36% decrease in contact angle uh, uh, in the measurements that we, uh, in the uh, results of the numerical simulations. Now, what is the potential application of all of this? Uh, Many years ago, we had uh, some field data and uh, the purpose of that project was raw classification and formation evaluation, but we had an observation we couldn't explain. So this is the production data and this is hydrocarbon production versus water production and we have two wells, well one and well two, and we had a high water production in one of them that we couldn't explain the reason behind based on the rock type and petrophysical properties. But later on, when we looked into the data, we realized that uh, on well one, we had lower thermal maturity of kerosene and we had lower water production. On well two, we had higher thermal maturity of kerosene, higher water production. So the hypothesis in here is that maybe uh, this um, thermal maturity and metability can have an influence on that uh, multiphase fluid flow and uh, water and hydrocarbon production, as well as rock physics measurements that we talked about today. So further investigation is needed for uh, quantification of all these impacts. Now I talked about unconventional rock physics models and this is actually an absolute need for these unconventional reservoirs. Uh, 
to minimize the calibration efforts, I showed you how it can improve estimates of water saturation and hydrocarbon saturation. We have some other projects for improving other petrophysical properties of the rock. We talked about rock fabric and how uh, incorporating rock fabric enables automatic uh, uh, formation evaluation, rock typing, and it can enhance uh, geomechanical evaluation. Um, we also talked about the importance of geochemistry and how can, it can impact the ability of the rock that can potentially can influence uh, multi-phase fluid flow, water production, hydrocarbon for production. Uh, in organic rich mud rocks. But my final words is that integration of rock physics, rock fabric, geochemistry, experimental work, and petrophysics, porous scale or core scale simulations, uh, that integration is required for reliable formation evaluation and reservoir characterization of organic rich mud rocks. At the end, I would like to acknowledge the support we received uh, from the members of our research consortium on multi scale rock physics, which enabled us to develop the research outcomes uh, uh, that my team achieved and I presented uh, today. And thank you very much again for uh, attending this webinar. I will be happy to answer your questions. So the first question uh, is um, if we have less than a threshold number or percentage of total organic carbon content or thermal maturity, uh, we can use conventional shady sand resistivity models. And if so, uh, what are these threshold numbers? So that's a very good question, uh, and this is right. This is absolutely correct. If uh, depending on the thermal maturity and uh, the amount of organic content, uh, shady sand, many shady sand models are still uh, reliable, and indeed, uh, we use these shady sand models um, very commonly for uh, our interpretations through some calibration efforts. Uh, the threshold, um, I am always actually very cautious about assigning a certain threshold uh, for making decisions and uh, whether our conventional models work or not, um, because that threshold very much depends on the rock properties. So it is not only clay content, it is an integrated impact of clay content, organic matter, geochemistry. So it's very difficult to say uh, a clay content of less than a certain number uh, because there are other properties incorporated. This is not only one property that affects uh, the response. And so that's the reason I'm always uh, supporting uh, the type of models that take into account all these components so that and they automatically take into account different components. So if one of these components is not important, then that impact is automatically eliminated without me having to assign a threshold. So I don't have actually exact numbers for this threshold. And the reason is that there are multiple parameters affecting the response at the same time. So I'm a little bit uh, cautious about assigning certain uh, threshold uh, on the rock properties. But we can certainly uh, perform sensitivity analysis for certain formation with uh, the certain thermal maturity with certain clay types. Uh, it's not only the concentration, by the way, the type of the clay minerals become important too in assigning that threshold. And that sensitivity analysis for a given formation is important to be performed be before uh, deciding about that threshold, but it is possible to do that for a given formation and that can be different for different formations. OK, there is another question that whether we have made comparisons against a model different than Archie's model. Yes, we have done a comparison against uh, uh, shady sand models as well. I don't have it in this presentation. I just needed to summarize everything uh, to make sure that I can finish on time. But yes, we have done uh, a comparison against uh, shady sand models as well. Indeed, one of the slides I uh, had poor scale uh, evaluation and that comparison was against uh, Waxman Smith model after calibration. So when we use actually these conventional method, model methods, we have to uh, perform calibration before uh, comparison and we do that to just to be fair uh, 
in our comparison. And the method that I showed you, it didn't need actually any uh, calibration, but the comparison that I uh, showed you uh, against the conventional method, the conventional method was calibrated before being compared, and we had it uh, for the poor scale. For the log scale, we have it, but we, we didn't have it in the slide. I will be happy to share that with you later on. It is in the publication that I listed in the presentation. Is there any research effort into estimating a mobile versus immobile hydrocarbon in liquid systems? But this is a very interesting uh, topic that you brought up, and uh, it is important actually to perform some research. We are looking into uh, investigation of uh, incorporating some of these concepts into the research we perform in our research team. Uh, at the time, actually, we, we did actually some research on presence of bitumen, but uh, regarding the mobility, one of my uh, PhD students started looking into uh, that important concept. I, I didn't have any of that uh, research plan in the presentation today, but I will be more than happy to discuss it with you further uh, after this uh, webinar. But yes, I absolutely, it's absolutely correct. It's very important uh, to, and this is actually very, a very challenging concept to uh, quantify that uh, mobility uh, terminology itself in organic rich mud, mud rocks. Is there any research to better understand uh, lost fluids due to oil expansion and water evaporation in core that impacts the measurement error of oil and water saturation. Well, this is another very important uh, topic that you brought up. And uh, the reason I mentioned in the beginning that these core measurements in organic rich mud rocks are not reliable anymore is uh, the impact of um, the this, this same thing that you are talking about. This is one of the reasons. It's not only about the measurement that we perform in the lab. It's about uh, the core as well and how uh, the core condition can affect uh, the measurements. In the results that I showed you today, we directly use the core measurements that we received. But it is very important to look into this aspect as well. And in the results today, I didn't actually, we didn't have any correction for that impact. And correcting for that impact requires some effort, including some modeling effort and some experimental effort on that. Is there any effort to improve the measurement of electric properties in organic uh, milestone systems? Uh, what we do is uh, taking uh, the electrical measurements and try to correct the impact of different properties on uh, the measurements before performing the interpretation. So what we do is to take the measurement and uh, make corrections uh, for the different properties affecting these measurements to be able to get a better uh, result out of this. But at the same time, actually, we are performing uh, some electrical measurements on rock samples and uh, we have started actually per, uh, working on some organic rich mud rock samples in the lab and and performing some electrical measurements uh, on those samples and uh, I will be happy to discuss those with you at a later time. Do, do you analyze uh, mobile hydrocarbon as well? Uh, how do you integrate this aspect of the reservoir? Okay, that's, that's actually a very a good question and this is in line with the previous question and that I answered. So it's very important actually to uh, develop techniques to quantify mobile hydrocarbon versus trapped hydrocarbon. Uh, but at the same time, it can be very challenging in organic rich mud rocks. This can be actually um, more feasible in uh, conventional formations, although it can be still challenging. But in organic rich mud rocks, even the definition of mobility from my point of view uh, uh, can be improved uh, for these unconventional resources. Um, we are working actually on uh, some experimental uh, research at the time. We have a new project in my team uh, that uh, works on the mobility and uh, relative permeability, which is actually a, another very important aspect uh, 
to be quantified in organic rich mold drugs at the time. Uh, but in situ assessment of mobile hydrocarbon, reliable in situ assessment of mobile hydrocarbon in organic rich mold drugs uh, is still challenging and it still requires lots of research. Um, before we can claim that we can reliably estimate mobile hydrocarbon in situ condition in these organic rich mod drugs. We are working on that, but it is a still an ongoing research. And how do we integrate this aspect of the reservoir? Oh, well, uh, the first step is uh, to be able to quantify that in situ condition, even assessment of the mobile hydrocarbon uh, in the lab can be challenging in this kind of rocks. Now, in situ assessment uh, is another level of difficulty. Uh, so uh, this is an ongoing research and uh, we, it, this is very important uh, research uh, in our research group that we initiated recently. Uh, but uh, this is an ongoing research and it requires some time and effort uh, before we can have an answer on how to uh, quantify that important property. Well, thank you very much everyone for attending this uh, webinar for all the great questions and uh, um, it was a pleasure giving this webinar and I uh, hope that you have a good rest of the day today. Thank you.